My name is Jonah Goose, and I'm here tonight to talk about democracy. Our country was founded on a fairly simple philosophy, a government led by its citizens. The simple principle that the voice of the people should matter most. The Declaration of Independence speaks to this. When the document talks, the government deriving its power from the consent of the governed. James Madison, Thomas Jefferson, our founding fathers, they all spoke about the importance of government being responsive to the people. How do we ensure that that happens? By voting, by exercising this fundamental, foundational, constitutional, sacrosanct right to vote. A right that each and every one of us in this auditorium has. A right that many have bravely fought and died for. Given our collective understanding of how important this right is, it begets a question that has puzzled me for as long as I can remember, which is why so few people in the United States vote. The answer, in my view, is because we make it so difficult for them to do so. In 2011, the Brennan Center did a comprehensive study of state laws that were being proposed across the country. And they concluded that if these laws were passed, up to five million people in the United States would have a more difficult time voting than they otherwise would. Five years later, it's no surprise that in the 2016 presidential election, we had the lowest voter turnout across the country in 20 years. It's not rocket science. The empirical studies show that the harder we make it for people to vote, the less likely they are to do so. And as we look across the country, you can see that in states where we've erected barriers to the franchise, you have lower rates of voter participation. This map may be the most thought-provoking map that I've seen of the 2016 presidential election, because it shows the volume of people whom simply chose not to vote in the 2016 election. That number exceeded the number of people who voted for either of the two other major party presidential nominees. In other words, if did not vote was a candidate, he or she would have won the election in a landslide. Now, all is not lost. There is hope on the horizon. Because in 2018, 113 million Americans voted. It was the first time in American history in a midterm election where over 100 million people voted in our elections across the country. It's something to be proud for, right? But although we've made progress, we still did not crack the 50% participation rate in the United States. There were some places where there was a little more glimmer of hope, and that includes Boulder. In, uh, in the second congressional district, the district that I'm so humbled and honored to represent every day in the United States Congress, we had the second highest voter turnout of any congressional district in the United States. Now, there's a pretty simple reason for that. It's a great candidate. But <laughs> the, 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 the candidate had very little. The candidate had very little to do with why voter turnout was so high, but I will have a more serious answer later uh, in my remarks. For now, I don't want to talk about me. I want to talk about another young man, this man in the middle. This 25-year-old African-American man is standing, you'll see him pictured in the, the slide, at the foot of the Edmund Pettus Bridge 54 years ago. He gathered with 600 other citizens, young people, activists, protesters, to protest the lack of basic civil rights for African Americans in the United States, beginning with the right to vote. And as they marched from Selma to Montgomery over the bridge, they were greeted by state troopers with batons and tear gas. Many of them were brutalized. 58 were injured, including this young man who suffered a, a skull fracture that he lives with to this day. That day is forever known as Bloody Sunday. That young man got up recovered, continued the struggle, fought on, was part of the 1965 Voting Rights Act, was later elected to the Congress, and serves in the United States House of Representatives today, and his name is John Lewis.
you know, one of the defining moments of my life was meeting Mr. Lewis for the first time a few days after I was elected this state, Colorado's first African-American congressman. And as I greeted him in Washington, D.C. And, and shook his hand, I had tears in my eyes as I thought about the struggle that he had so bravely fought. And his admonition to me is the same admonition that he gives to everyone in this country, which is that the struggle continues and that the promise of the American dream will not be fulfilled until everyone engages in our democracy. And so, we are left with the same question I asked earlier. Why do so few people vote, and how can we get more people to vote? One way is to post adorable pictures of, uh, this is my wife Andrea and my, my wonderful uh, infant daughter Natalie, two months old. I have many more pictures to share after the TED Talk. If this doesn't convince you to vote, I don't know what will. But in all seriousness, I think the way that we get more people to vote is the way we've done it in Colorado and here in the second district, which is we change the laws and we change hearts and minds. What do I mean by that? Well, changing the laws is fairly simple. In Colorado, we have some of the simplest and most accessible voting laws in the United States of America. We have all mail ballots so that folks can vote from the convenience of their own home. Same day registration. We've broken down the barriers to registration that exist in so many other states. We have early voting. We have pre-registration for 16 and 17 year olds so that when they are getting their driver's license and learner's permit, they can pre-register to vote and we know, and empirical data tells us, that they will be far more likely to engage as citizens the rest of their lives if they do so. We have fair redistricting, unlike many states, Pennsylvania, where the maps were so gerrymandered the courts just recently struck them down. They were described as goofy, kicking Donald Duck. I don't know if you can see it in the picture, I certainly could not. <laughs> the point is this. If we change the laws, we will honor the legacy of so many who bravely fought for this fundamental right that we all share. Now, wouldn't it be nice if the United States Congress would package all of these reforms perhaps into one big bill? A set of reforms that adopted the best practices from Colorado and Oregon and elsewhere across the country, perhaps introduce it as their very first bill of the 116th Congress. Well, I'll tell you, we did that. It's called H.R. 1. <laughs> earlier this year, <laughs> earlier this year, the Congress proposed a, a set of electoral reforms, the most comprehensive that we've seen in a generation, and I was proud to vote for those. But I will tell you, changing the laws is not enough. As I said in the beginning, we've also got to change hearts and minds, because so many in our community, in our state, in our country, are disillusioned with the state of politics. So I'll tell you a story. Fifteen years ago, a group of young people here at CU and I, my friends, uh, a couple of whom may, you may know, decided to get together and create an organization that would focus on registering young people to vote. We felt like the political ecosystem didn't really provide a seat at the table for young folks like ourselves. And we thought it would be important to create an entity that would talk peer-to-peer -to, -peer to young people to make politics fun again, to get them involved in a way that they hadn't been before. We did what any rational young group of entrepreneurs would do in creating a nonprofit uh, of this kind. We got a grant and we quickly spent most of the money on a bus. <laughs> That's the bus. The organization was called New Era Colorado and this was our first purchase. Uh, we called the bus Tiny Dancer after the Elton John song. I didn't come up with the name. Uh, I see some people are applauding for that. And we drove this bus across every corner of the state of Colorado. We took the bus to college campuses, to festivals, to concerts, to try to register young people where they were. We talked to them about the issues that they cared about. We tried to make politics fun again. We filmed an episode of Candidate Cribs. I'm aging myself, but for those in my generation, they'll remember the mid-2000s MTV show that was fairly popular. We knew that Election Day was one week after Halloween, and so we decided to create an event called Trick or Vote, where instead of trick-or-treating, we would dress up in costumes and go encourage young people to get their ballots in, irrespective of what candidate they would vote for or what political party they might be affiliated with. I'm proud to say that this group of young people, and many more, 
registered over 190,000 young people in the state of Colorado over the course of the last 15 years. These young people changed hearts and minds, and we are proud to have handed off the baton long ago to a new group of young people who steer the organization now and continue to do that important work. And so I will close there, that fundamentally if we change the laws, and if we change hearts and minds, we can change the voter participation rate in the United States of America for the better. We can honor the legacy of Congressman Lewis and so many others who bravely fought for this fundamental right to vote. And fundamentally, we can restore our republic as the framers intended it. Thank you for having me.